Well, thank you one and all for coming. Um, uh, always nice to see nice big turn after these things. Uh, how many do we have on Zoom? 22. 22 on Zoom as well as what we have here. We must have about 20 people here as well. So that's very, very encouraging. Very happy to see that. So tonight, last night, or rather last month, it was all about things that grow in the sun. And tonight we're going to talk about all the shady characters, all the things that like to grow where it's a little dark and, uh, and it likes it that way. So this first slide is, um, uh, I think I mentioned this before, this was taken at Sibylla Brown's um, Oak Savannah, uh, south of Des Moines, and it's almost at the Missouri border. And it's, I think, a very important thing to uh, get your bearings with because uh, when my uh, ancestors first came here to Iowa in the 1840s, this is what they saw. Uh, southern, southeast Iowa uh, was an oak savanna, not a prairie, an oak savanna. And um, the eastern mm, quarter or so of Iowa really is more wooded, and it's the transition between the eastern deciduous forest and the tall grass prairie. So yeah, there is some tall grass prairie in our area, but we're actually in a different ecoregion from the rest of Iowa. We're in an ecoregion where the oak savanna, oak hickory savanna is the more prevalent ecosystem. And so um, that's a great and wonderful thing for a few reasons. The nice thing about it is that oaks, um, Put down their roots very deeply and so do hickories and I think you were telling me the other day that you transplanted a hickory and boy was that a job uh, because you know it's like one big root and kept going kept going kept going kept going so this is good news though if you want to plant all this other stuff because unlike a maple tree that has all the roots up by the surface the oaks run deep, so you can plant all kinds of things underneath oak trees, underneath hickories. It's really easy. So it really supports uh, a greater diversity of plants uh, than either the tall grass prairie or a woodland. Because you have more open sunlight, dappled sunlight in that ecosystem, you can grow just about all of your prairie plants, but at the same time, you can grow all the truly shady things or the things that like it in the shade as well. Uh, so it is the ecosystem that has the greatest diversity of uh, plant species and probably also animal species as well. The reason that the uh, Native Americans tried to cultivate this kind of um, ecosystem, and they did so by uh, selective uh, burning uh, was so that they can more easily hunt game with the uh, open for open you know openness of the savanna uh, and also it's more attractive to the animals that they were hunting like deer <laughs> which is now sort of a problem but um, uh, but nonetheless that's why it's a forest edge kind of environment and there's a whole lot of critters that that is their preferred environment. So without any uh, further explanation, I'm gonna pass it off to Dan and um, he'll talk a little more about some of, now that it's uh, April, about some of our spring ephemerals. Thanks, Steve. It's a thicker network. There we go. Oh, there we go. I was going to say, just my luck. Well, hello, everybody. Thanks for being here on this awesome sunny day. I thought this shirt was appropriate because we all want to be in a change here. That's why everyone wanted to be here today. So I want to talk a little bit about spring ephemerals because it's the season for them right now. Um, essentially, we're seeing uh, no leaves in the sky, so it's ample time for plants on the understories to have their chance. So what is a spring ephemeral? So 
These tend to be very early blooming wildflowers. They have this strategy of living most of their life cycle before the trees even put out their shade because it allows them to take advantage of the lack of cover. But once the trees come by, they can certainly tolerate the shade. So what makes them really important, and what you'll notice if you're walking around the forest, is that they are the first line of food and energy for a lot of our awakening pollinators. Because if you walk out in the forest right now, you'll see and hear the buzzing activity all throughout, but you'll, what I will give for examples there. So making sure we have these as ground cover is very important. So some local spots that you can find our spring ephemerals out here, I will give two recommendations. One is the Jefferson County Park, essentially southwest of town. And the other one is going to be the Lamson Woods State Preserve, so to the southeast of town. Um, I've been to both within the week, and they have some interesting activity coming up, which I'll highlight a little later on. Maybe a little bit of a glance. Not working too well. What is that? That's a bumblebee coming yeah. out of there, right? Yep. That's a bumblebee coming out of its and It's actually a bumblebee queen, because oh. this is that time of year where the queens are often the ones to come out first to get the resources and they'll establish their new colony. So that's why it's even more important to have these early nectar and pollen resources out there because the, the royalty is wanting to establish their kingdom. So just to kind of get an eye for some of the things you might find out there if you go to the different parks around, I just wanted to highlight a couple uh, common, couple charismatic spring ephemerals that you would see. Uh, starting with spring beauty over here to my right. So spring beauty, it tends to be a little more generalist. It's not super picky about the, the, the soil quality. It can tolerate some disturbance. Um, but what makes it very noticeable, it has two uh, essentially leaves paired to each other, opposite leaves, very narrow, as you can see right here. But essentially, it has a very fine pink and white flower. And you will find ample supply of them in most forests. The other, to the furthest, you'll have the prairie trillium. Another very kind of bizarre, almost alien looking plant, to be honest. Um, when, you, when you hear trillium, think tri, think three leaves, because you'll always see them in these three leaved whorls, essentially not much else. <laughs> when they flower, they have these really interesting reflex maroon petals. As you can see, they don't lie out in open face like a lot of our flowers and asters out there. They're almost straight up. So it's just a very unique sight out there. Um, a comment on what might be a strategy, you'll notice that the leaves look kind of mottled. They have a dappling of color. It's not solid green. So there is some thought on maybe why it has that strategy. It could be because having that kind of depth appearance might make it a little less appetizing to browsing deer, perhaps. Or it could also be a form of camouflage. Who knows that? I actually got that. You got ahead of me. <laughs> There we go. So going down, those two tend to be a little more common, a little more tolerant of disturbance. And these guys tend to be just a little more, uh, less tolerant of disturbance. Uh, for the one closest to me, you have white trout lily. That's a fun name, how to get that. So what could be is that this dappled look um, of the leaf right there, and perhaps the shape, perhaps the color, it may remind somebody of a trout, who knows. But what's really charismatic of it are these reflex white petals. Um, it kind of looks like a tomato flower, to be frank. But they'll only shoot up that one single leaf, and then soon will come the, the stem with the flower right there. You'll find them kind of these dense clonal mats, very charismatic. Uh, one of my favorites, the furthest over there, it's called Blood Ruth a very um, eye-raising name <laughs> because it actually gets that name from the root and sometimes common name makes sense. So if you if you happen to snap the root, it'll actually have kind of this, um, almost like a silicon, like bright orange material leak out. And it has a lot of medicinal uh, uses with indigenous people in the past and present. Um, but otherwise the flower is a very beautiful open face. It is a member of the poppy family. So that could be why it gets that charismatic appearance. And then, my favorite of the bunch is Virginia Bluebell, I'm biased. Um, 
The other pictures uh, I pulled from Illinois uh, wildflowers.info, um, but this one is one I actually found out and about in Lansing Woods. <laughs> so these two pictures are actually from the field. There you go. They're still out there. Um, just go on the trails in Lansing Woods out there. Um, what's really uh, interesting about how it blooms is that it will transition from this baby pink when the flowers are buds and go to this very um, very gentle baby blue almost. Um, the, the leaves are uh, very round and have almost um, a very smooth rubbery feel to them. Um, these are ones that can be planted as bare roots. So some nurseries will sell them as bare root plants that you can add to your own shade environments out there. And I actually ordered a couple for my, my folks out in bluegrass. So um, I'm excited to see what results we might have. So the two locations that I mentioned, Jefferson and Lamson out there, um, they actually have some interesting management going on that is actually promoting our spring ephemerals out there. So how can we keep the spring ephemerals thriving? Let's think over in Jefferson County. There is some work dealing with invasive shrubs out there right now. So uh, bush honeysuckle and multi-floor rows are some of our biggest offenders for suppressing spring ephemeral flowers. How they work is that they'll be among the, the earliest things to leaf out, and they will shade and suppress things even before the trees begin to leaf out. So by eliminating that shrub competition, it allows the sunshine to wake up all the spring ephemerals and to not block them out from essentially insects that are wanting to access them, birds wanting to access the insects, and then the bats will also want to access the insects. Um, for Jefferson County, that work was actually funded by a bat grant. So the work to essentially get this happen was coming from the perspective that when we do all these actions, the cascade will result in more food resources for our awesome bat species. So what you'll see in that picture over there, sometimes you'll see these open areas in the forest now, what looks like wood chips on the ground, fresh wood chips. Um, and how they did that was a forestry mower that came through and essentially just ate down that shrub. So sometimes those machines of destruction could be used for a force of the... So going to the other location here, over in Lamson Woods, there are two very interesting things that are being done over there that replicate um, sources of disturbance on how these forests maintained themselves in the past. Um, the first of what you'll notice very clearly as soon as you get to Lamson is that there are a lot of downed trees right now. Um, and that is in part because there was a forest thin that happened. So a forester essentially wrote a plan, Cassidy, our local forester, in an effort to promote our oaks and hickories, we want to open the forest so they have enough room to expand and grow. And when they are they, essentially they trying to sun also. What's that? They need sun Absolutely. in order to sprout. So sometimes having essentially access to trees can even be a little bit of a bad thing. Because um, what we've noticed in a lot of our, our timberland is a lot of what would possibly be bottomland trees, say like maples, basswood, ash. Are actually slowly trending upwards as they don't have disturbances to keep them at bay. And to those disturbances would just be essentially um, wood fall, essentially the trees falling as they get older, as well as burns that would sweep through. So what you'll notice over Lamson right now are a multitude of downed trees as it's open for the oaks and hickories to get that full sun that they need, as well as the burn to essentially address some of that woody vegetation and also return some of the nutrients of the leaves back to the soil there. So those are two very striking things. And it was all managed, it was all meant to happen. <laughs> and we want it to happen. So my last thing here was just a tip of mine since we're talking about shade gardening here. And it essentially sounds really simple. It's just lead the leaves. This is something to think about once we start getting into the fall. Um, but when we're thinking about getting out rakes and bags to take leaves away, we want to think about how leaves have interacted with wildlife before we got here, essentially. Leaves were one of the refuges for our insects and amphibians and other essentially forest-dwelling creatures. So it acts as a bit of a buffer in the soil and allows an insulating effect to happen. A lot of uh, insects will actually take, take refuge in the leaves over the course of winter time. The woolly caterpillar, a very charismatic caterpillar that we see, um, is known for hibernating in leaf litter. 
And another matter is if people are starting to think about bringing some of these shade plants home, some of these forest plants home, it helps to bring that kind of habitat to them. A lot of them need well-drained soil, but also moist soil. So a way to get the combination of that is to keep your leaf litter at the base of your plants there. By keeping the ground moist with the leaves, you're catering towards that forest environment that these plants originated from. And the last thing is aesthetic. Um, when it comes to leaves, there is still a way to incorporate them in your yard. Uh, think if you have a giant tree in the middle of your yard, you could essentially break a, a tree or like a leaf skirt. So essentially just make a ring of leaves around the tree to show that this was intended, this is managed. If your yard is not derelict, it's all with uh, intention. Um, sometimes it just it just has the, a little bit of um, finesse to make it part of your, your natural landscape right there. Um, so a little sign is never hurts as well. So if you've got, say, a little wild patch, having a little sign that signals to your, your homeowners association and your neighbor to say, like, this is all under control. I meant to do all this. <laughs> so that's pretty much the end of my presentation there. And now we're back to the Savannah. So back to Savannah. Thank you. Okay, so I already explained this uh, slide here. Um, so I will go on to the next one, maybe. Oh, Steve, before you continue, yeah. I just wanted to check in really quickly with the people on Zoom. Is the volume all right? Can you hear this our speaker or speakers well enough? Yes. All right, good. good. Thank you so much. I'm just going to make sure um, we have 26 participants right now. I'm just going to um, take a quick look at our participants and um, just remute everybody to make sure we don't have any, any unexpected interruptions. Thanks. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. Now, where do I point the clicker? At this, at this. Screen at, or at the, at the computer. computer? And down. Huh. No, I'll help you. I think you have to do it. There we go. All right. <clears throat> uh, if you have shade and you want something that looks like a lawn, but it's not grass, <laughs> oak sedge, that's the answer. Uh, and if you're lucky, like I am, and like Magda is here, you have it already on your property. If you have a woodland in Iowa, you probably already have it. Uh, because, um, you know, it was established long ago. Um, this is a plant that does not grow particularly well from seed, though. So that is why it's a little less known to people because grass seed, you can simply, you know, toss some seed and you get a lawn. This one grows by underground runners. So you have to have a little plug in order for it. And in the last 20 years, people have discovered this plant that lived back east in the woods. And now it's like the number one, one of the number one selling plants uh, through um, such places like North Creek Nursery and so forth that sell a lot of these plugs. Uh, so it actually is a very easy plant to grow. Once you understand it, it, you simply take the little plug, put it in, and you know, so long as you have regular rainfall, that's about all you have to do for it. Uh, what else is nice about it is that if you want to, you could even mow it. So, you know, it can act just like a lawn would, except that, um, it supports the uh, brown-eyed uh, caterpillar and moth and uh, about 20 other of our native uh, moths and, and butterflies. So of all the grasses or grass-like uh, types of plants, this one actually, uh, your, your carrots in general or sedges uh, support more than probably most of your grasses do. So, um, so it's a good one to have. What's nice about it also is that when you're landscaping for the shade, um, you want to start what is called a matrix. 
And that is that you have just sort of the uniform ground cover at the very floor that you can have your spring ephemerals grow up through. You can have all of the other plants that we're going to be talking about come up through it. And that just gives a nice backdrop to it. And from an aesthetic, an aesthetic standpoint, it, it gives you a basic green from which you can interplay all kinds of color. And so it makes it all work very easily. Next one. I should also say that the maximum height on the oak sedge is about six to eight inches if you don't cut it. So it's, it's just low. Uh, this is another one that likes it in the shade or it can, like, it can take sunshine as well. Uh, and it's become, um, you know, in the last four years, I've really come to appreciate this plant. It is just tough as nails and it'll grow anywhere in any condition just about. And um, uh, it has this beautiful fall color. And then in the summer, it gets these red berries like that. And uh, it has a history of people making uh, a pink lemonade out of the red berries. So it does get, have kind of a lemony uh, kind of uh, taste to it. And then of course, it also supports the showy emerald moth. Um, uh, that's the caterpillar. It looks like a leaf, but uh, no, it's a caterpillar. And, uh, and then it turns into this kind of nice looking moth that you see there. Um, when you first see it growing real low to the ground, you'll see that it has three leaves and it looks a little like poison ivy at first. It's not, it is somewhat distantly related to it, but it does not cause any rash. Uh, doesn't have any problem like that. So I think it may be in the same family, but it's one of the ones that um, uh, does fine. And it does tend to spread a little bit, so you will get a bit of a thicket with it, but it'll grow in the shade quite nicely. Next. Another one that if you have a woodland in Southeast Iowa, you will have this plant most likely. It is coral berry. And it normally gets to about, oh, two to three feet tall, and it spreads by runners. So it does form uh, an underground thicket quite um, readily. And um, uh, this shows you on this right there, well, you know, what it looks like when you, you know, mass plant it or have several of them around. So it really makes kind of a nice two foot tall ground cover. And then in the fall, it has these coral red berries like that, um, which are nice. And it also supports the uh, snowberry clear wing. Next. <clears throat> if you have a little more moisture, um, so it would be probably like on the uh, north slope uh, as it's going down uh, to a, towards a stream or something. This uh, plant makes a beautiful ground cover. This is wild ginger, and it only gets about this tall or so, about six inches tall, but it, it uh, scrambles over the ground quite nicely. It has a very um, rather inconspicuous flower. It's just sort of a brownish purple flower, and it's under the leaves. Um, and the seed eventually that forms from that, these black garden ants, will uh, that seed exudes just a little bit of um, uh, sap and sweet. And so the ants will go for those seeds, bring it down into the burrows, and then they plant more of it that way. So in this case, the ants are doing the job. Um, go ahead. It's a deciduous vine also, so it loses its leaves in the winter. Uh, Another one that uh, I think most everyone likes around uh, is the wild strawberry. It does, as all strawberries, make a nice ground cover and uh, stays to about six inches tall and has a white flower in, in uh, June or May, May to June, followed by, you know, the red berries, uh, which are very sweet. Now, all of your cultivated strawberries this was one of, this is the original from which it, you know, one of the crosses that made to the cultivated ones. Uh, the difference is that your wild strawberries are smaller 
and they will be much sweeter uh, because a lot of the crosses have bigger berries and a lot of that bigger berry is water. Uh, so if you really want them tasty, I'd say go for the, go for the wild strawberries. Um, now, not only do people like them, but so do just about every critter out there. And um, uh, you can expect that uh, if you, unless you put netting or something that, uh, you know, the birds and everyone else out there is gonna have it, but that's okay, you know, let them have it as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the blackberry looper um, is frequently, a, a, this is the host plant for it. And then it has that nice, again, green moth like you see there. Next slide. Um, well, this is a, a personal favorite of mine. This is the wild geranium. Uh, it would be more accurate to call it a wild cranes bill, but most people are not familiar with that name. Uh, but it's called a cranes bill because uh, the seed capsule looks kind of like a cranes bill. Um, <clears throat> but it has these very nice pink flowers in May, like that, and it gets to about 15 inches tall. Uh, and it does spread, so it, it will send out shoots and uh, it does, it's not a voracious spreader, but it does spread. This is my backyard. Wow. So uh, this is what goes on there come May. And I remember Diane had the pleasure of seeing that uh, one season when it was at its peak. I believe I fainted. <laughs> I'm just about did. He did swoon appropriately, which was what, what I was going for. <laughs> but it is really something when you see it, and the whole, you know, it's, it's a good half acre that is, uh, you know, filled with the wild strawberry like that, or wild uh, uh, ground uh, geranium. Yes. So I used to grow these in Oregon, but they were blue. Ah. Got it. This is the native. This is the native. Our native wild geranium is pink. And yes, there are uh, cultivated geraniums, cranes bills that are blue, and there's other pink ones and other white ones. But this is our native one like this. And there's also a cultivated form of it that is has a purplish leaf. But um, uh, but just a plain old white, you know, uh, green leaf like that is fine. You know? Yeah. I'm curious, would this out compete creeping Charlotte? Um, you would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to be fair, you would probably have to get rid of that creeping Charlie first uh -huh. and then, you know, put in the wild training. But it should if you do that, you know. Um, uh, the other thing that is, well, we'll get to that in another slide. And then, of course, the geranium budworm. Uh, is one of the many, uh, this is a fairly active, or, uh, you know, supports a lot of biodiversity uh, on the property. Go ahead. Another very common one, if you have a woodland in southeast Iowa, is the woodland sunflower. It's kind of ubiquitous, and like sunflowers in general, um, it's a little aggressive. So it can really scramble and kind of take things over a, a little bit. So every now and then you might want to do a woodland burn or, uh, you know, dig up some of it to kind of keep it in check. Uh, but it does get to about three feet tall. It has nice um, daisy-like flowers, yellow like that in July. And uh, it's just tough as nails. So, you know, it can take the drought and everything else that Iowa can dish out just fine. And I can um, report that I do have this Gorgon checker spot uh, butterfly quite a lot. And they're often out there, yeah. Is this similar to the false sunflower? Uh, no, this is the true sunflower. So it's a helianthus, whereas your heliopsis is the false sunflower, but it looks similar. Uh, the Heliopsis uh, will be about a four, sometimes five footer, and it grows out in the prairie. Whereas we have several different types of sunflowers. The most common one that you see in the prairie is the sawtooth sunflower, but this is the woodland sunflower, and it stays to about three feet. And um, 
spreads like most sunflowers do rather vigorously. Steve, the people on Zoom just uh, requested that uh -huh. if, if we get comments or questions from uh, out here, that we them. make sure that we repeat them up here so that people online can hear as well. Okay. So yes, the uh, our little owl came right here in the back. So I will repeat. All right, next slide. Uh, Doug Tallamy uh, was very impressed with this plant, so that's why I mentioned it. Uh, this is our Virginia creeper, and I really like the plant when it creeps. I'm not so in love with it when it clambers up a tree, but, um, but it certainly is nice to uh, fill in as a brown cover. And even if it climbs into a tree a little bit, it can be um, particularly like a cedar, which has you know that deep green foliage, evergreen, and then in the fall you have that brilliant scarlet foliage uh, that really plays nicely, so that you have Christmas colors on your cedar tree. Uh, and then it gets these blueberries that birds love to eat. And then uh, Doug's favorite was, I guess, the Virginia creeper clearwing. <laughs> so he liked that one quite a bit. Next slide. Ah. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, that's is it's starting to come up now, but it's really be May before it blooms. This is our native woodland phlox, just about 15, 18 inches tall, and has kind of sky blue flowers like you see there in the month of May. Um, it's just a beautiful thing to see in mass. I have seen some woodlands just filled with it. Uh, Magda has some nice patches of it uh, next door to me. Uh, the bunnies get mine, but um, uh, but uh, somehow seem to leave hers alone. And it's because, and this was the tip that Diane gave us last time, you, you want to kind of stuff it in where the bunnies can't get. <laughs> so you saw how I had the coral berry and that kind of thing. You kind of plant them in and amongst that kind of thing and maybe some wild onion and so forth. So this, uh, the scent throws them off and then the bunnies won't get it. As much. As much. <laughs> right. And then uh, the spotted straw moth uh, feeds on it uh, besides the bunnies. Okay. Um, May apple. Um, also, this is probably like the second largest plant in my garden here is the May apple because it is a spreader. And it makes a really nice umbrella uh, low to the ground like that in May and June. And then by July, it's gone. So it is a true ephemeral, but um, but it really gives you a nice contrast with that. So it's probably good to have your um, wild ginger and some other ground covers to go through that so that that will remain when uh, that disappears. And then uh, what's really nice is that if you plant it up on a hill, you can then see the flowers because the flowers are underneath the umbrella. But if you see it planted up on a hill, you'll see under the umbrella a little bit. And that way you can observe the flowers, which are really quite nice. Now it does get edible May apples, hence the name, uh, but wait until that's really ripe before you dare try it because the entire plant is poisonous, but the May apple itself, not so much. <laughs> but you have to wait until it's right. Because if you eat it too soon, you may not, you may regret it. Um, now, Mr. and Mrs. Possum come in my yard and eat the May apples. Uh, so, you know, there are critters that eat them, but um, for the most part, uh, it just makes, I think, a very nice, ground cover like that. And um, the, uh, the flower is pollinated by uh, Dan's bumblebee. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, Jacob's ladder. The, mo the most beautiful Jacob's ladder I ever saw in the world was in Diane Porter's home. Oh. It was astonishing. It was about this big around. And it looked pretty much like that picture there, just covered with these lavender blue flowers. It was just stunning. Um, it's called Jacob's Ladder because the leaves kind of step up like a ladder a little bit. Um, and 
Well, I'll tell you a little backstory as quickly as I can with this is that, uh, you know, I have been in the horticulture profession for a long time and worked for a nursery. And Europe has Jacob's ladders, and so does the United States. But the Jacob's ladders that grow in Europe can't take the heat. And they would uh, bring them, uh, we, there was one, uh, they found one European Jacob's ladder that was variegated. And I remember there was a trade show that I was going to uh, that all of the booths had this on display. It was the new shiny thing that everyone had to have. This is like back in 1995 or something like that. <laughs> and everyone, you know, was just fooling and awing and isn't it wonderful? And then the next year, nobody had it in the <laughs> <laughs> and that's because it went through one of our typical summers and it all just died. <laughs> but our native one has no problem whatsoever with our heat. So that's another reason to choose the native. There is a variegated form of this too. It's called Stairway to Heaven, and the name <laughs> Jacob Ladder. Uh, but um, I think just the common green one is uh, all you need, really. Uh, and it does support the uh, uh, coliflora moth. Next. Ah, so there's golden rods that like the sun, and there's golden rods that like the shade. The two that really like the shady uh, places uh, is the um, zigzag golden rod, and then the elm leaf golden rod. Um, and the two most uh, life-supporting plants uh, in perennials are goldenrods and asters. They have, like in our region, about 75 different coleoptera, uh, which means moths and butterflies, that uh, will go to them. So, you know, they support more life in our region than probably any other uh, two perennials uh, that are out there. So it's nice that we have them both for sun and we have them for shade as well. Um, and so the common pud moth is one of the many that go on them, but um, uh, they in the shade they have a much more delicate appearance. Shade ones that you know the shade uh, woodland golden rods. Uh, and next slide. And of course they always go very well with asters. And you can see the. Uh, elm leaf goldenrod there with the woodland aster. So the most common one is the um, Symptiotrichum portfolius. There's a few other woodland asters as well, but most likely if you see an aster blooming in the woods, it is this one in our area. And then this strange looking thing here, the saddleback uh, caterpillar and moth, is a host that uh, that's a host plant for it. Uh, Dean, next slide. Dean, yeah. Even though there are uh, spring plants through the woodland aster and the goldenrod woodland, do they still bloom in the fall? Even though yes, they bloom in the fall. The aster and goldenrod both bloom in the fall. So mm -hmm. you know, I I kind of went in order of the season there, so that you had some. You know, Dan talked about the spring ephemerals, which are first. And then, uh, well, and then the last one, of course, this is not, <clears throat> this is the opposite. This is blooming right now. Uh, this is uh, one for spring here. And a matter of fact, I saw some blooming in my backyard uh, today. Uh, and I showed another picture there, something called a confederate violet, which is actually just a variety of the common violet. So it's a natural variation that you'll see out in the woods uh, if you look for it there. And I've, I've seen it, you know, in my backyard as well. And if you have violets, you will have fritillary butterflies. So the two go together. You have to have your violets if you want to keep that species around. And I think that, well, okay, one more, two more. Putting it all together. You most the majority of your woodland flowers bloom in the spring. 
Now, the exception, of course, was the asters and goldenrods, which bloom in the fall, and then there's sunflowers that bloom in July. But most of the ones in the spring um, are your, you know, wild phlox. Your, in this case, it's a white violet, along with the red bud that's blooming, uh, that also grows well in the shade. And then you have uh, the uh, prairie trillium with the phlox again. And uh, two combinations I like, red columbine and golden alexanders. Mm -hmm. Alexander got moved a bit yeah. somehow, but, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, those, uh, those give you some ideas for combination because when you think of these individual things, it's good to think what's it gonna be playing with. <clears throat> Next slide. And then most of your prairie perennials bloom in the summer and the fall. So you're gonna get the biggest bang for your buck out in the sun at that time of year. So here we have summer phlox, uh, which is a native, usually it's a little south of us, the Missouri or so, but you know, it does do well in this area too. And then this is your uh, green, uh, green headed coneflower and then Joe Pieweed in the back. Um, these two are quite tall. This is about a three footer. And then a nice combination also would be like a purple coneflower uh, there, the blazing star, which is this spire. And then uh, in this case, a, a yarrow, which is one called apple blossom, which has kind of a pink flower. And then on the far right, uh, they brought back the prairie to the High Line in New York City, downtown Manhattan. <laughs> so uh, that picture there was a project that I worked on. Uh, we grew the plants for this uh, park, which was an old elevated train trestle that ran through New York City, Manhattan. And they um, stopped running the train through there and put in, um, you know, big amounts of soil, like three feet of soil and planted it. And uh, now it's all kinds of, um, what you see there is prairie drop seed, there's a butterfly weed, uh, there's some uh, blue star and echinacea and um, collenium or sneeze weed and some bee ball. All the Iowa prairie went to New York. <laughs> and it does just fine there if you take the heat. <laughs> which it gets pretty hot up on there. And then what's nice about it also is that um, you have enframement of all these skyscrapers. So the contrast is quite dramatic. You have, you know, you're walking down the sidewalk and on either side of you is this little prairie planting and then you have all these skyscrapers on either side. New Yorkers absolutely love it. It is always jam packed full of people. And it's made, you know, that part of the city livable and changed the entire downtown there. So uh, that's all I've got for now. Yeah. And Diane. Uh, yeah. Alex is going to find my presentation here. Hi, everybody. So I'm so impressed that Steve worked on that on that elevated uh, flower I, way. I've read about that. I've seen the pictures of people's radiant faces as they're walking along there. This must be heaven. It's absolutely marvelous. And you worked on that. And that is so, so cool. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about shade plants. And particularly, I'm going to... I'm, I really kind of tried to look at this from the point of view of what about planting plants in shade will help us have birds in our yard, okay? I mean, I do absolutely love the flowers. I'm crazy about it. I'm not saying anything, belittling the flowers by any means, but I'm just taking the point of view of saying, how do you, what's the intersection between the wildflowers in the shade and the birds that we get in our own yard. So I'm finding out here, native shade plants for birds and living with nature. We wanna live with nature. We don't wanna have nature someplace else. And that's really the purpose of this whole 
this whole group, we're a bunch of people who want to say, how can we bring nature home? How can we have it right in our immediate living space as Doug Talon has just so beautifully laid out for us? So um, it's not going forward. Shall I hit it again? There we go. Oh, all right. So the first wildflower <laughs> that comes up in the shade at my house and probably most places where I mean, well, there are the, the spring beauties are already starting, and I've seen a few of those uh, uh, dog tooth violets. What is the other name for them? Um, trout lily. Uh, trout lily, yeah. Uh, the trout lilies. But the first thing that really comes up and goes boom after the Virginia bluebells is the wild columbine. And this is a great a great favorite of mine because it generally opens. I generally see the first blossom on the same day that I see the first hummingbird. And they arrive together and it's no accident, no accident at all. And you look at the shape of that, of that flower and you realize that the, the nectar is up in that little tip up at the top, right up. Right up here is where the nectar is. In fact, I'll bet you, raise your hand if you've ever nibbled off the tips of those. <laughs> only, only three people, I bet you more. Four, all right, okay. Five, six, all right, good. It's a neat thing to do. You, you just barely bite off the very tip of that flower, and you get the tiniest ace. I mean, if it were light, it would be one photon. I mean, it is such a tiny bit of, of, of nectar. And I, I, I'd like to know, I tried to Google and find out how many calories. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently nobody has ever studied it. But <laughs> for the hummingbirds, the hummingbirds come for it like crazy. And that long bill is just the right length to oh. fit into that beef channel, yeah, channel where, the, to, where the nectar is. And then it refills after the hummingbird sucks out the, the nectar. You know, I don't know how long it takes because I've always said I should really watch how long is it until, and then will I know is it finding anything or is it just testing one that was already there? Hard to say, but they do come back after a while. They cycle back as the flowers fill up again because the flower has got a motivation. Of course, the flower's game is, is getting pollinated because when the hummingbird is doing all this neat stuff. You see the, all that business end that's coming out of here on the left end of that flower? Then we got the, the sexy bits of the flower. And that flower is putting a little bit of pollen on the top of the hummingbird's head. And then when the hummingbird goes to the next flower and has a drink, that pollen gets picked up by the next flower. And bingo, we have a baby. We have for another flower. Ah, all right. Now, this, this picture that I showed you, I started out with, it's under my redbud tree. This is my, this is my view at my living room. I call it my set because this is where I, I sometimes just sit and watch what birds are coming out. Diane, um, someone online asks you, that you would repeat the name of that plant or flower that you just showed. The, pre, the first flower, can I go backwards for this thing? You should be able to. All right, this is the wild columbine. You and and aquilegia is the, the scientific name for it, but it usually goes for columbine. And there are many different columbines throughout the country. There's a there's a one in in, in uh, Colorado that's blue. It's quite impressive. But this is ours. This this is the the Canadian version, but it, it's aquilegia canadensis. It's it's our columbine. We have only one columbine in this part of the country, and we have only one hummingbird, and they go together. They evolve together. So the hummingbird was getting a longer bill while the, while, the, while the flower was getting a longer, a deeper place to get the nectar out of. They, they fit together, and the, the bird, I mean, the birds are supposed to pollinate the flowers. The flowers don't want to have something come and get the nectar that's not going to pollinate them. So they want to save the pollen. They want to save the nectar for the hummingbird. So they make the, 
gets a little longer, needs to be a little longer reach, and the hummingbird makes a little longer <laughs> reach. And they just kind of, you sort of imagine it's going on over a long period of time. And you end up with a, a flower and a bird that match each other. It is the common, it is the columbine. And now I, I, I didn't want to spend that long on the columbine. We just have to leave something out there. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the red bud because this, because it's on the south side of my house, it gets sun, but under the red bud, there's shade, especially after the leaves come out. So that's why I'm already getting spring ephemerals. I've already got um, the, the, um, the blue one, the Virginia uh, bluebell is up. The, the columbines are making nice foliage. But they haven't made any flowers yet. I expect the hummingbirds on May 1st. I expect the flowers about that same time. By the way, don't bother to put your hummingbird feeders out quite yet. The earliest that anybody has reported one in Iowa in the last 10 years was on April 22nd. Mm -hmm. They usually really, you might get one the last week. I once saw one on April 25th, but really May 1st is when you can start counting on them. So you can put your hummingbird feeder out early if you want to, just to see if you can get one before your neighbor does. <laughs> but, but if you do that, be sure you put clean nectar in it every other day because you don't want to get moldy nectar. For the hummingbirds, that's not a nice thing to do. Okay, so under that redbud tree, see, I'm going to go back for a second here. The redbud tree, right now, you don't see much shade, and that's why the spring ephemerals are starting to show up. There's blood root that's going to bloom, there's Jacob's ladder, a lot of different spring ephemerals, but pretty soon that red bud is going to be all leafed out. And then it's going to be pretty dark under there. This is right the same place. I'm still, honestly, I'm sitting in my living room taking this picture. So right underneath that red bud tree, it's now shady. These leaves are the leaves of the columbine. Pretty nice foliage, you know. I, I, I've got nothing bad to say about the columbine. And you'll notice that this bird is standing on a pile of moss. This is a this is a brown thrasher, and he he'll go out in sunshine. He's not afraid of the sunshine, but he really likes to dig for stuff in the dirt, and he needs to have soft dirt that hasn't been cleaned up too much. So under that red bud tree, now this is a picture taken later in the summer. You can see there's already some dead leaves that are hanging around there. He's digging in the dirt. He sweeps his feet from left to right, trying to dig up little, little tiny invertebrates that he's going to eat. And sometimes he really throws the dirt out. <laughs> when I first started seeing this, I, I, saw, I kept finding these holes in my garden and I was blaming my dog. <laughs> you dig out there. And then I saw that it was the brown thrasher doing that. And I was so ashamed of myself. <laughs> daylight out of that dirt, but, but he couldn't do that if I had, you know, done something to the land, you know, had it all grass and mowed it up tight or put bricks around it or, or planted some uh, hostile uh, plant there or something like that. So um, up higher in the tree, this was still in the redbud tree, this is a Cape May warbler. Now we're looking at something that's more like this season. This picture was actually, I took this picture in late April, a couple of years ago. Here's this beautiful little warbler. This thing is like, I mean, if you took the glass out of your glasses, that bird could easily fly through the frame. You know, this is a, a tiny little bird, very, very small, quite spectacular. This is the male in his beautiful plumage. What is he doing in the red bud tree? Well, he's looking for something to eat because this bird wintered in Central America and now he's on his way up to probably Canada to breed. He's not going to breed here. He's just passing through. So while he's passing through, he's got to eat. And what is he going to eat? He's going to eat insects. And oops, <laughs> the wrong way. <laughs> this gorgeous animal here is a caterpillar. This is, this is Moni Haynes's picture. This is a 
caterpillars on a red bud leaf. And if this caterpillar is being very bold, being right out there on the top of that leaf like that, if this warbler came through at that time, this caterpillar would be in not. Canada. Yeah, yes, he will be on his way to Canada. <laughs> All right. But my point is that the redbud is a beautiful tree. It has nice leaves. It's quite pretty. It has gorgeous pink blossoms. But it's doing something much more for the aesthetics of our lives than just being a pretty tree. It's making food for birds. And the main food for birds is caterpillars. And that's one of the things Doug Talamy emphasized so much in his talk is about the fact that we want to grow the plants that will grow bird food. He said, think of every plant in your garden as a bird feeder. Is it an empty bird feeder or a full bird feeder? <laughs> if it's got some plant that came from China where it where it's fed on by some insect that doesn't live here, that's an empty feeder because nothing is going to be on that plant. But if it's one of our native plants, it might have one of these guys on it and it will be food for the birds. So if we want to have birds, then we have to make, give them something to eat because that warbler's got a long way to fly. He's so tiny and he's got to fuel himself completely with muscle energy. You know how if you like take a two hour hike, you're tired and you're also hungry. This bird has been flying hundreds, a thousand miles, 1,500 miles, and he's got to have food. So we want to make sure that we're planting plants that are going to make food for the birds when they need it. And they need it a lot in spring when they're migrating. Mm -hmm. oh, here's, a, speaking of caterpillars, here's an Eastern Phoebe that's eating a caterpillar. And a, I, I asked Moni Hain, who's an, who's an entomologist, the person who studies insects, and I asked her, hey, Moni, what's this caterpillar? And she went, oh, I'm on a walk right now, but when I get home, I'll uh, look it up. Uh, mm, she writes back later, uh, there's not too many pictures in the books or on the internet of showing the underside, but I think, I think that it's the caterpillar for a, a buckeye butterfly. <laughs> So I'm saying, wow, you know, impressive that she could come up with that, which she did. She said, if it's not that, it's a close relative. But I'm also thinking, isn't it interesting that you can't just go look it up on the internet right away? We don't know what everything is. We don't know what all the what all the all the caterpillars turn into. People who are really studying insects. They go out into the fields. There's a wonderful woman named M.J. Hatfield, who's the great ornithology expert of Iowa. She goes out into a field while people are having walks, and they're walking two miles, and she's out there, and she's looking. You know, she's gotten that far into the field, and she's looking at a little tiny moth that's wrapped up in a leaf. And saying, you know, I don't think I've seen this before. I don't know what this is. And she notices what the plant is that the, that, the, that the caterpillar is growing on. She takes it home with some of the plant that she puts in water and she raises the caterpillar in her house. She said, her house is quite amazing to look at. She raises the caterpillar so that she can see what it turns into. And half the time, we don't know. Science doesn't always know. No. This stuff isn't known. We kind of think that, oh, science has got it all figured out. Biology is all figured out. It's not. It's not figured out at all. We know far less than half of the species, even of the big stuff on the planet. When you come to insects, over half of them have not even been described, haven't been, even been given, given names. And of the ones that are named, less than 10% have been studied. Which is, nobody has really looked at them. Where I get that information, I didn't make it up. I got it from E.O. Wilson, who is one of the greatest biologists of, our, of, our, of the world. He just died two years ago. And he's the great guy that inspired Doug Calamy. He was already a great entomologist. He just He's written many, many books. He's often compared to Darwin for being such a forward thinking thinker. He's come up with so many new original ideas in, in biology. And 
Um, Doug Tallamy tells the story that when he first met him, he said he was very shy to meet him because Doug Tallamy was just out of graduate school and E.O. Wilson was the great man, but he went up to him to say hello and E.O. Wilson smiled and reached out his hand and said, I'm so happy to meet you. And they sat down and they talked for a long time and Doug was really, you know, he was really excited to get all this information and this great inspiration from E.O. Wilson. Now, Doug Tallamy had already seated and finished graduate work in entomology, insect study. And he got an insight from E.O. Wilson that he never realized before. E.O. Wilson said to him, you know, insects are the little things that make the world work. They're what runs everything. They're the basis. They're what turns plant material into biomass, into animal mass. And every animal that you see, including ourselves, is either alive because we're getting nourishment from plants or from something that ate plants or something that ate something that ate plants. And that's true for you and me. It's true for the Cape May warbler and the brown thrasher and the eastern phoebe. It all goes back to plants. And the main thing that translates the energy from plants into animal is cat is insects. They're the first step. So here's this little Eastern Phoebe, and he's got this thing in his mouth. Why hasn't he eaten it? Babies. He's got babies. Mm -hmm. It's not advancing. Diana, um, if it's okay, maybe um, I think I'd like to um, turn the podium a little bit. <laughs> Kind of um, like direct your voice kind of in this general area, kind of more like that. That way, I think everybody out here will hear you and people there can hear too. Sorry, Thank you guys. <laughs> All right. Okay, now I won't be able to know whether it's advanced the, the picture or not, but am I aiming at the computer? It's not. Oh, it did it. All right. So um, here's another one of Moni Haynes' wonderful um, uh, pictures. And I... I can't remember the name of it, and I can't read it from where I am. Do you see it there on the screen? Covered up. Oh, it's I covered up. Yes. Dysodia. Oh, yes. Yes, so something eyed. Something eyed. Dysodia. D-Y-S. Dysodia moth. Okay. Did you know such a thing existed? I certainly didn't. Sorry. We're... I, I want to be up, up, up. Is it thirteen? Thank you. Right there. Thirteen. Okay. There you go. All right. So this is sodium moth. But what does it eat? Well, we it eats, among other things, white snake root. What's happening to the picture here? Sorry. Shane. There we go. All right. Oh, you got it. Here's what white snake root. Now this is a little plant that grows in the woods in the shade. It's all over the place. And a little bit later into the year, you see its flowers. You've probably seen these if you walk through Chautauqua Park. It's full of these little white flowers everywhere. They're quite pretty, but they're not spectacular. I mean, when I see white snake root in my garden, I don't go, oh, it's not like that at all. I mean, it's just kind of a throwaway plant. It's just there, not particularly gorgeous, so it's okay but it's grown this one particular kind of caterpillar and some other caterpillars that I don't know about because again, we don't know everything and we're finding out more and more that we don't know everything. But we do know one thing. We know that baby birds have got to eat every day, many times a day for several weeks while they're in the nest. And that means that the parents have got to find food for them and they are not feeding them carrots. <laughs> They are feeding them caterpillars. They could also feed them some other insects, but most in insects are scratchy. But caterpillars are soft and gushy. They're like <laughs> melted marshmallows. <laughs> They're just wonderful going down. A mother can cram that down the baby's throat, and she's not going to do anybody any harm. But she needs caterpillars every day, and feed too, because daddy also helps with most of his nests. 
They need those caterpillars every single day. Mm -hmm. And the caterpillars, maybe all the moths will lay their eggs of one species at one time. And their caterpillars are all nice and juicy at the same time. But two weeks later, those caterpillars are done. They've turned into moths again. Now what is the bird going to feed its babies? So you need a succession of caterpillars. And if you're going to have a succession of caterpillars, you've got to have a succession of the plants that host those caterpillars. That's what biodiversity means. So that's why when I see white snake root, I go, oh, cool. That's fine. I'm glad you're there. Ah, all right. So can you read the name of this one? This is another wonderful owlet, I think, this model. Brown-footed owlet. Right. So, whoa, look at this. This is another of Moni's pictures. Look at this character. Well, now, interestingly enough, Steve was telling us how the asters are one, some of the most, the asters and goldenrods are some of the most valuable plants for producing insects to feed birds. Well, this is one of those plants. This lives on, this is on a goldenrod right now, but it does live on asters. And in fact, here's the blue wood aster. Steve showed you a much more spectacular uh, example of this, but I found this growing under the trees in my backyard. I went, oh, that's interesting. An aster growing in the shade. What in the world? I had to go look it up. It took me forever to figure out whether it was blue wood aster or Drummond's aster. They're exactly the same, except for a difference that nobody would ever notice having to do with how furry the leaves are on the <laughs> underside and how deep the little sinus is at the base of the leaf. It's, like, it's important to Mr. Drummond. It <laughs> is. Now, my little app every day insists that this is Drummond's aster, but I'm telling you, I spent a hard day with a microscope, and I assure you, this is blue wood aster. <laughs> that little sign is. Anyway, it grows good caterpillars. And then the violets, I'll do this real quick because Steve already did the violets, but you know, we know that they grow the fritillary butterflies. This one is the variegated uh, fritillary, and this one is the great spangled fritillary. And uh, when I was putting this together, I didn't know Steve would have already done this. So I thought I better spruce up and find out a little bit more, something juicy about violets that I can really wow them with. So I opened up my computer and I Googled violets in the garden. And I got a whole page of ways to kill them. <laughs> Problem, wild violet description. How to get rid of wild violets in your garden. What are wild violets and how do I get rid of them? The 10 best herbicides for wild violets of 2023. Oh. Do we, I feel like we all need to rush out in the street and grab people by the shoulders and say, don't kill your violets, they make fritillary butterflies. Now, I did read that the caterpillar for the fritillary butterfly is not tasty and that it might even be toxic. And I went, no, that's not going to work at all. I can't tell them that. <laughs> I'm going to find some butter, something that eats the fritillary butterfly caterpillar. And I did find that in California, the scrub jays have been seen to grab the caterpillar. But my take on that is, once again, we don't know everything. <laughs> Maybe most birds do avoid them, but maybe something else eats them that the birds eat. The complications of what, if you take every organism, it lives on something and it feeds something. Everything does that. There's a wonderful Sanskrit expression, ahum and um, I am food, okay? <laughs> Everything is food for something. And so we, we don't even know what those things are, then we're just not being competent, you know, members of the physical world, and we should get with it. <laughs> All right, back to the uh, brown thrasher, because I can't pass without telling you a little bit about mosses, because mosses, I don't know, mosses have gotten to me this in the last year. I mean, 
there's something that I used to think I'd see them now and then. Now I see their find their mosses everywhere. I mean, they're just they're all over the ground. They're on the trees. They're on this one is this one has a great name. Though. This is called Fluidium delicatum. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just love these names and I love these things. I mean, these, these mosses are so great. Now, birds don't eat mosses. And insects don't much eat mosses. So why do we care about mosses? Well, they do provide something that protects the ground and lets other things get started in them. They make a real moist place for seeds to get started. They sop up moisture like crazy. When I bring mosses in and put them under my microscope, I put a drop of water on it and I've watched this little thing go <laughs> and just swell up to 10 times its size. So they have some amazing stuff that they do with water. But birds do have uses for mosses. Now here's a black cap chickadee and it lines the bottom of its nest inside with mosses. Chickadees don't make a nest out in a cup in a tree like most birds do. If they did, they wouldn't put moss inside because it would make their, their baby birds get wet bottoms. And you know, mamas don't like their babies to have wet bottoms. So <laughs> they would not do that. But because they nest in a cavity, and then you can't really see it very well in this picture, but this is a birdhouse. And that's why I happened to have the opportunity to open it up. And I saw that it was this thick. So for those of you who can't see my fingers, it was three inches thick with moss in the bottom and then the nest was on top of it. So I thought that was a pretty cool use of moss. <laughs> and the Eastern Phoebe that we saw earlier with that strange caterpillar, it likes to use moss in its nest too. Steve was just telling me that his Eastern Phoebe has made a gorgeous nest that's completely surrounded in bright green moss. Notice that it's on the outside of the nest, not on the inside. And here's an old nest. This is late in the year. This is the Eastern Phoebe. The babies are almost ready to fledge. And you can see that the moss is there, but it's all dried out because, you know, it's been up there for a month and moss has to be sprinkled with water in order to be green and stay alive. But it did make a nice camouflage. And uh, I found it anyway, though. <laughs> So here's some moss that's growing against some wood. It's got these cool little things that shoot, shoot up called sporophytes. It's got the little, the little uh, capsules at the end that have spores in them. Mosses don't make flowers and they don't make seeds. They simply reproduce by spores. And I shouldn't say simply, they complexly <laughs> reproduce by spores. And the spores are so tiny, one capsule, and I'm not exaggerating here, one capsule can have a million spores in it mm -hmm. and some mosses. Mm -hmm. So these spores are so tiny, they don't exactly go thunk and fall on the floor or on the ground. They waft up into the air and they're carried on air currents all around the world. There's probably uncounted moss spores in this room right now, unless the filtering system has taken them all out. And so there are moss spores landing everywhere all the time. And they're going, to, they're going to grow if it's a conducive place, like in the shade under a redbud tree or in the woods, they will grow. And the main thing that we need to do to help mosses, don't try and plant them, please don't buy them. Do not buy mosses because the way they sell mosses is they go strip mosses out of nature mm -hmm. and then sell them. And the thing is that this little stand of moss here, which is small enough that all fit on the center of the palm of my hand. It's probably 10 years old. Moss grows like, you know, a centimeter a year. So when you take big masses of moss, that's a bad thing to do. And we don't want to do that. Unless you're a chickadee. Chickadees have a pass. <laughs> All right. Now this is a nice expanse of moss. This is the, uh, the, the roof of a shelter at Lacey Kiyosakwa completely covered with moss because it was under the trees. Mm -hmm. And here's this little uh, chipping sparrow. I'm not exactly sure what that chipping sparrow was doing on that moss. <laughs> I, uh, I really tried to find out. I have very detailed information on the life history of every bird. We may not know everything about plants, but we know a lot about what birds eat. Mm -hmm. And chickadees do not eat moss <laughs> and they do not eat um, 
insects that are in moss. They do eat insects sometimes, but insects don't much live in moss. Um, and they don't build nests out of moss. So maybe he just, you know, he was just having a good time there. I don't know, but he was pretty. And I, <laughs> I've always been rather pleased with that picture. The so, oops, wrong way. All right, so, all right. So when I really got crazy one day, I, I got a kind of a microscope, a compound microscope where you can really you know, get it at 400 power. So this is one leaf off of a moss that you're seeing up here. And what's cool about it is that you can actually, you're not sitting too far in the back, you can actually see the individual cells. You may notice that there's a kind of a matrix picture effect as you can see little round things. Those are the cells, except for these things that look like sharp spines, but they're not sharp. sharp. These are softer than a mother's blood. These are really soft, but they look sharp. And each one is just one cell. This is from a moss called Atricum, or maybe Atricum. I don't know how you say it. I just got it in a book, out of the book. But I did look at this moss, and I got really fascinated with it. So then I bumped it up a little more magnification. Okay. <laughs> and so now, the reason I wanted to put this in here is that you may be able to see this. This seems to have degraded the image a little bit. But because I'm standing right up here, I can see that there's individual little round green things inside of the cells. Mm -hmm. You can see the cells, which now look big enough to, you know, place the palm of your hand, but each one has got, I don't know, 10 or 12 little green things in them. Now, the thing about moss, the tricky thing about moss, it's different from other plants. It doesn't have roots. It doesn't have big, thick uh, tissues. The leaf is only one cell thick. That means you can put it under a microscope and you're looking at the whole, you know, it's like looking at an arm, except that it's only one cell. So when you look at this and you're seeing those cells, you're seeing the little factories inside of the cells that are photosynthesizing. These little green places have the, are the chlorophyll and this plant is taking the energy of the sun and by using chlorophyll, it transforms energy of the sun, nitrogen in the air, and water into living tissue. This is a picture of matter being transformed into mass in the plant. It was inert matter, now it's living matter because of the energy of the sun. So this, the reason I'm putting this in here is that once we, once we realize that that's going on in the moss cell, we realize that's going on in every plant. That's why plants are green. That's what they're doing. And that's the great secret that allows plants to hand the energy of the sun onto the insect after it's, made, after it's used the chlorophyll to make plant tissue. And then once that becomes caterpillars, now it can become birds or rabbits, you know, it, it all works. All right. Oh, just to not get too carried away on the, on the caterpillars, birds do eat other things. Sometimes they actually eat the moth. Here's, we're back to that same Eastern flycatcher, but I mean, Eastern Phoebe, but this time it's got a little, a little skipper butterfly in its mouth. It's going to those same babies. Here's one's got a, a mass. Uh, actually, this is a mantis. So after I, you know, I sat one day on my porch and watched the 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 Phoebes fly out into this grassy field, just a messy field, and come back with mantises. Mantis that they must have brought 500 mantises. They just trip after trip after trip, going down the gullets of those babies. <laughs> These tiny little they must have just hatched out there in the field. So, you know, I went and looked in the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology's book. I mean, their, their, their website that tells all the details about what everything eats. And I'm trying to find out whether Eastern Phoebes eat mantises. Well, there's no mention of mantises <laughs> on there. But you see, that was an opportunity. And again, it's a little, another little indication. We don't know everything. Who would have guessed? 
that the mantises were feeding the baby eastern phoebe. But it's another reason, because out in that field, there was lots of goldenrod. I guess goldenrod makes mantises. But if you don't have these native plants, you're not going to get mantises or little skipper butterflies, and you're not going to have those little birds. And so here, just because we're doing caterpillars, here's a red-eyed vireo eating some kind of a caterpillar up in a, the tree is a locust tree. And I guess that caterpillar eats locust leaves. And that's why the, the uh, honey locust, right? Yeah, honey locust, mm -hmm. right. All right, so now just to sum up the reward, if you don't kill your violets <laughs> and you don't kill your mosses and you grow the native stuff in the shade, in the sun, then you will be producing full feeders for the birds, the ones that live there, the ones that pass through, and you will have the reward of the joy of birds all the time in your life. See how I did that? Yeah. All right, so here's just a few oh. of rewards. Here's the Eastern bluebird in the red bud tree. Here's the Cardinal in the red bud tree while it's in bloom. And here's the Baltimore <laughs> Oriole. What's it in? It's <laughs> in the red bud tree, okay. And, ah, okay, the yellow throat, the yellow rumped warbler is the first warbler that comes through in the spring. They're back, I say back, but they're really not back, they're passing through. They will not breed here, but they're here for a fairly long time. It's unusual among, among warblers because it's a warbler that can actually eat seeds and fruits, which most warblers are just like, well, that's not food. But these guys can, so they can come back early before the insects are out. Mm -hmm. That's why we already have them. But they still really like the insects because that's really a high nutrition uh, food for them. Here we have the scarlet tanager. Now, scarlet tanagers, we do have them in Iowa. They are in the woods. They, you will find them, if you have those nice spring ephemerals down below, you may have scarlet tanagers up above, and they even breed here. But this, I have to tell you, this is a little bit of a sad story because just having caterpillars isn't enough for, for scarlet tanagers. You have to have vast forests, much bigger than we've got. If you take a big forest and you cut it in half by putting a road through it, you lose the scarlet tanager. Aww. So in Iowa, scarlet tanagers keep coming here to breed, but they're not reproducing themselves to enough to replace themselves. Mm -hmm. The only reason they don't dwindle away to nothing is because we're getting them immigrating from other places where they are successful enough, where they do have bigger forests. So we can't, you know, we can't really do well with the scarlet tanagers, but we can have a few and at least we can help them do better than they would have. And um, and it just, but it's kind of reminds us that we can't fix everything. We, we can try and make it better. And that's the best we can do. And the uh, chickadee that I showed you in the nest, it's just nice to have them around and you have them around if they get enough food to eat. I know you heard the story, but I got to tell it one more time because Doug Tallamy says it's not enough to hear something one time. So I'm going to do the chickadee thing one more time here. Doug Tallamy set up a research project back east where he lives. He had his graduate students go around and get a bunch of homeowners to agree to participate in this study. They had each homeowner, they put a, a, they put a, a box up that was suitable for chickadees in each yard. And then the homeowners had to monitor the, the uh, box and see how many eggs were laid, how many babies fledged as best they could. And then the, the graduate students counted up the plants in the yard to see if they were native, mostly native, or mostly non-native plants. What they found out it was that if the yard, because the chickadees don't go very far for food, they're not going to go to the next block. If you've got chickadees in your yard, they're going to get all the food probably out of your yard, maybe the edge of your yard, neighbor's yard, but they're going to get it locally. So if it was mostly native plants, the chickadees had enough babies to reproduce themselves. So if those parents died at the end of the year, the species would go on. But if there were more than, was it 70 or 30? I think it was if it was more than 30% alien plants, that is non-native plants, then the chickadees 
would nest, but they would not succeed in raising enough babies to reproduce yeah. themselves. Mm -hmm. So that means a yard that's full of petunias, not the kind, not the good ones like we grow, but you know, the ones that you buy at Walmart, petunias and you know, tea roses and zinnias and ginkgo trees and all this stuff that's non-native that doesn't grow insects or birds. If that's what the yard looks like and it's mowed right up to the edge of the tree so that no caterpillars can go down and live in the in the under in the in the ground underneath it, the, that bird box is going to be a sink to the population. But if that same household just plants some more natives, then they can start becoming source for food for, for chickadees. And I know we all want to be a source for chickadees. <laughs> And just the last thing is, this is the cardinal flower. There's the, the uh, columbine again. There's the, this is just more part of the reward, the hummingbirds for the, for, this is for the cardinal flower. See how this little red dot is right on its forehead? That's the little, mm -hmm. the little pollen, <laughs> little pollen packet from the flower. Then it's going right in the, on the bird's head and then it goes and gets, isn't that cool? All right. And that looks that's it. I'll just leave that picture up. Okay. So, if there are any questions, yeah, yeah Claudia. Questions for people who are not, they thought, and they want to be. Um, maybe you can the handouts are available on the library's website on our events calendar, and they're going to remain there. So, you know, you can go and get them from there anytime you like. You go to the calendar page? Yep, the calendar, the calendar for this event, the calendar, um, and um, you can download everything from there. You can also go back to the, back to last month's Homegrown National Park event, and you can download last month's documents there. How do you go about that? I'm going to have you speak. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, well, the one you can go is that sometimes local fire departments are looking for opportunities to train on, say, dealing with field burn. Um, so, sometimes by giving them a donation, they could conduct a burn for you. But, um, that one of the lists of resources on there um, from the Tall Grass Prairie Center. The one that I provided was it's a pretty long list, but that one does also have some um, CRP service providers. So some people that are often hired out to conduct burns and make contract management for CRP fields. Mm -hmm. But local fire department, then using that could be a good way to go. Thank you. So we're in the process of, of a condo association to clean out all our dryer vents. And I know that sometimes they're used as uh, areas for wasps and other kinds of insects to be housed. And we can ask by the vent cleaning company to, you know, clean out the vents with pesticides so that they don't have to deal with the wasps. Any recommendations on, on how to handle such a situation? It's going to be about 20 or 30 homes that may have lost in them. The time of year. If you do this in the winter, right, usually not a problem. You know, I, I cleaned up all the wasp nests in my house during, you know, because wasps aren't using them then anyway. Unfortunately, we fired this company to come in the uh, end of April. Uh, well, they're just starting. Yeah. If you get a cold night, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Then. Do it in the morning yeah. when lower temps are happening. Because yeah. the more more energy, the more they'll take on, the more feisty they'll be. <laughs> so look for the cold opportunities. All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to know if the jewel is uh, made, made because oh, it's such a magnet to, to uh, come into it. The question is about is jewel weed native? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. 
so that's a good one to have around. It's not the showiest of plants, but it is nice. Yeah. And uh, it certainly is, uh, you know, you'll, you'll have lots of critters going for it. And, um, you could have a uh, hummingbird like that. <laughs> yeah, we do. We do. We have quite a few. Yes, Einer. Um, last meeting, there was somebody, uh, a man on the side, and he said, as of then, three people in Jefferson County have registered for homegrown national park. Yeah, nice. Nice. Three properties. <laughs> How can we that? Well, you just go to uh, Doug's website there, uh, Homegrown National Park, and you put in your, you know, your address and so forth. Uh, and, uh, you know, the more and more people do that, you know, it's, it's just, um, if I have this correct, and I think I do, is that you just have to have, make the commitment. Right. You know, it, you were not going to be able to do this, uh, uh, turn it all the way back, you know, like the first slide, uh, you know, immediately. But uh, if you're just starting with it, you can, you know, put put down your address and then, you know, I planted a columbine or I planted a golden Alexander or something just to get it started. Then you're on your way. And I did a calculation. <clears throat> There's 61 national parks in the United mm -hmm. States. Homegrown National Park is number four, is the 47th largest oh, yes. listed, but I told, I suggested to them, how can, you know, only a couple more thousand people yeah. will make number 46, like how high can we climb that ladder? And yeah. They haven't, they didn't reply. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good, a great idea. Fairfield National Park, yeah. Could you just kind uh, of, uh, repeat a little bit highlights of what Einer said um, uh, just in a sentence or so. Well, um, he said he, uh, Einer did a calculation and found that uh, really between all the people that are on Doug Tallamy's website uh, as Homegrown National Park, we're only a few thousand, was it square miles or square feet? Well, there's 61,000 acres in homegrown national park. Okay. And so if you look at, there's a chart that I found on the internet so, you know, from the national government, the national park website, I think. And it lists all the 61 national parks. 61 national parks. And it lists how many square miles or acres for each park. Right. And so if you put 61,000 acres, which is homegrown in there, right. it comes out to, between no, it comes out right between number 46 and number 47. Okay. So it's the 47th largest, and it's only a couple thousand acres away from being, you know, 46. Yeah. In other words, what he's saying is that we're just a few, you know, thousand acres away from being the largest homegrown or the largest national park. <laughs> 46, 46. 46. Right. right. And we could just keep climbing. Yeah. Words, the average acreage. For a property in homegrown national park is about three acres. Mm -hmm. There's about twenty thousand people with about sixty-one thousand acres. So there you have it. And Iowa is in the second rank of the most acreage. Huh. Uh, there, there's five groups, and we're in this in this group of the second most wow. members. That's uh, encouraging. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that, Einer. And uh, and you know. We encourage everyone to look at the Homegrown National Park website to learn more. Yes. Uh, what do you think of Russian sage? Russians, Russian sage. Well, um, not native, as you, as the name implies. Um, <laughs> what I would use, I would use instead, would be Agastaki. Uh, we have our native Agastache that would fill in. It blooms about the same time. It has a blue flower, blue to violet, and it gets to about uh, three to four feet. Um, and uh, Anis hyssop is the common name. And that's also, it's, it's very popular with the bees. Yes. I have another question. You said about the sedge. Oak sedge. Oak sedge, yeah. Uh -huh. Will that take over grass? If you have solid grass and you put a plug in, will it take over? 
No, I, I wouldn't. Steve, would you repeat the question? Yeah, the, the question was asked if uh, you plant oak sedge and you have it competing with your lawn, who would win? <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. Uh, <laughs> the answer is the lawn. Uh, so unfortunately, you have to get rid of the lawn first. Okay, so you just pull the grass out or pull the grass out mulch or, or mulch, it. mulch it, you know, mulch it, put leaves on top, like and Doug then one. Put the plug in the mulch. Yeah, you okay. can. Let's take once it once it dies down a bit, once the mulch has died down. I'm going to take a few questions from Zoom actually. Um, some people out there have been asking questions. Um, one person asked, um, Are pill bugs native and good, or can we still squash them? <laughs> I don't know. Does it, I, like the I, classic roly poly? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're great. They're essentially part of the leaf litter. They're part of the, the insects, or they're actually not insects, but essentially they're part of the invertebrates out there that'll help break down the leaves and help return them to the soil. Right. They're like centipedes, that kind of thing. So, right. yeah, um, not so nice in a house, but outdoors, they do a lot of good. Um, another one um, where can we buy oak sedge plugs? Well, there's all kinds of nurseries back east that offer them, but there's not too much out here. You, I would say you'd probably have to go to Chicago uh, before you find places that uh, in that area that um, will uh, sell them. And then one last one, is it also important not to mow under pine trees? I'm surprised that anyone can mow under a pine tree. <laughs> um, usually if you have a pine tree, you do not have grass. <laughs> Uh, does someone actually have grass? I'd be impressed. I mean, <laughs> too, uh, uh, maybe they're mowing, maybe they're kind of mowing the, the needles that have fallen. Yeah, I mean, generally, if you have a, a pine tree and our white pine is the one usually seen around here, mm -hmm. the needle cast from that is so thick that you don't have anything else growing underneath it. And in addition, the roots of the, the pine are pretty close to the surface, so it just takes all the moisture out. So generally, you know, what you have underneath a pine is uh, pine needle mulch. <laughs> How about one or two more before we close? Okay. Um, right here. But, but if you do have a pine that does have some grass coming up, what would you suggest? And, and I also wanted to know if you can walk on that whole stem. Well, if you're going to have success with any kind of ground cover, it would probably have to be a vine. So it would be something like Virginia creeper. That would probably, you know, because its roots are way far away in other places, um, that would probably make it. Okay. Can you walk on that old bench? Yeah, you could walk on it. I mean, you couldn't play touch football on it, but, you know, you could walk right. on it a little. I have a question about moss. I'm putting uh, chips and leaves. So under my tree and under our oak tree, I found patches, part of them under our oak tree, but some patches of moss. Now, if I don't transplant that, how can I grow or let that moss expand? Should I take out the grass like for several inches around each patch? Or what do I do to get the moss patches to be larger? Eliminate the competition is one oh, of the best things. Question okay, first. sorry. He has some, uh, Einer asked that he has some moss growing in an area of his yard. And how do you encourage moss to grow? Yes. Yeah, like I'd say like you have a right way to go about it because eliminating the competition is one of the best places to start. And one of the biggest hurdles of growing moss is that in terms of succession, so the order of things, tend to progress from say like bare rock to climax community. You know, moss is one of those early um, covers that'll eventually give way to say grass or wildflower competition to shrub and whatnot. So when the areas that you do find it, there are often a couple of factors that are inhibiting say grass or sod to take place. So giving it a head start around an existing patch of moss could give it ample opportunity to grow. But another question would be what the moisture is like in the areas around it. It's just making sure that 
that kind of moisture is in place for it to spread. There's only one area about as big as about eight or nine of these chairs where there's moss. So I stop. I'm not going to mulch in there because I don't want to cover up the moss. And then I was thinking of going around and uh, taking out the, the grass several inches around each patch of moss. Does that make sense? Well, as, as Diane was saying, in the air, there's a lot of spores. Yeah. And so um, <clears throat> if you want more moss, then that means you need to add water and uh, need to have shade. And then you'll get moss because the spores are probably already there in the soil. Okay. Uh, so that's the main thing. Well, thank you. I, I think that will be our final question of the evening, but we can talk a little bit after the program is, has ended. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. Yeah. It's been wonderful having you on. Thank you, Steve, Dan, and Diane. Wonderful job. Thank you.